Good morning, everyone. Most of you probably don't need to attend this session, so I think it's uh, just a very kind of you to show up, uh, and probably because there's nothing else better to do. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jason and I are going to present about how to apply the standard called 14971 to the AEM program. Uh, hopefully, uh, this is not something too uh, new or exciting or different from what you already seen. Uh, but nonetheless, we are, would appreciate any feedback, comments, suggestions, criticisms, uh, because we are embarking on this journey uh, for some time and uh, we'll continue to be doing it. Okay, so let's see. This clicker doesn't seem to be working too well. All right. So there are powerful thing. It says. I think it says on. It says on. Well, wow, that's in case of doubt, flip it again. All right. No. This is a pointer only. No, it's not doing anything. All right, just flip it by hand. Great. No, no, it's, it's frozen. Yes, well, it's not frozen. It's it's there. Oh, it's a screen save. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure it just went to sleep for a second. Okay. There we go. So oh, well, and I'm I'm doing by by oh, clicking okay. the mouse here. It should. There you oh. go. There we go. Okay. Yeah, you're the boss. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're not going to read everything here for you because it's a total waste of time and energy. You can uh, download this later and and check it out for yourselves. So we're going to talk about what, why we are here and who are the speakers, and then uh, we're going to go through the historic perspective to refresh your memory about what happened and why we have the EM program, and then really go into the details how to apply it. And finally, we're going to discuss and see what can we learn from uh, the experience, and we really appreciate you're participating, contributing to the discussion, okay? So the objectives is really showing why the traditional risk-based criteria is really not good enough for AEM planning. And also the alternative that we are using and proposing is the ISO 14971. It is a little bit of a square peg into a wrong hole type of situation because that standard was created mostly for manufacturers or medical devices and not exactly servicing, but you can tweak it you know, to be uh, usable for our needs and provide some guidelines and examples how we did it, okay? Uh, this is myself and this is Jason. Again, we're not going to waste your time reading these things. So I'm going to pass the word to Jason from now on, is your thing you want this? You prefer the one? Oh, yeah, that's. Take the wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, jump right in for the historical perspective. Can you guys hear me fine? Like I said, I'm hearing myself behind me. Ship. All right. <clears throat> so, originally passed in uh, 2013, SNC 1407 kind of gave us the opportunity to switch from the uh, OEM mandate to the AEM structure model. Um, it still required certain OEM requirements, lasers, uh, x-ray equipment, stuff of that nature. Um, but uh, again, this um, did give us that, it opened that door. All right, so the, the 1407 memorandum reflects a long history. The Social Security Administration in 1965 created the conditions of participation, or COPs that we know today. So 
this is a very short sentence to describe a whole lot of um, interpretive guidelines that CMS puts out. So there's about a 30 page guideline currently where facility supplies and equipment must be maintained. It's a good read if you guys are having a hard time sleeping while you're here. Highly recommend downloading the interpretive guide. So in 1965, the uh, Social Security Administration recognized the Joint Commission and uh, the AOA's HVAP as deemed accrediting organizations. 2008, Congress put uh, all uh, accrediting organizations under the CMS uh, purview. So, and somewhere around 09-10, um, someone called to complain that Joint Commission was putting too much flair. I mean, there was differences between the accrediting organizations uh, and they were looking for a, a little more standardization. So this is kind of where they issued the uh, SNC 1207, which required all OEM. And uh, I don't know if you remember that. I greatly remember that. Uh, I had my uh, EOC chair ask me, are we ready for this? It's like, yeah, sure. Um, we do OEM or better. It's like, what's better mean? Like, you better not ask. Um, we've got some old stuff here that we just don't have manuals for. So, um, yeah, it's OEM or better. Uh, and again, um, that's leading to the, the revision in 2013. So, jump right in. Oh, the alternative equipment management, which again, I think um, you've heard management or maintenance to be the last M um, program is established uh, that both us and the FM side utilize or are able to utilize um, through this, with exception of, again, imaging and radiology equipment, medical lasers, and devices that we find too new to place on AEM. So we were tasked with developing policies and procedures to implement a AEM program. So AEM programs are based on generally accepted standards. Um, we, we all have a, I guess, a, a moral compass that we use when we serve as medical devices. Most of us realize that someday we or a loved one could end up on that medical device. So we wanna make sure it's safe, right? Safety above all. The decisions on this must be made by a qualified person. Who's qualified? Anybody? Nobody wants to take this? Just been seeing? So if you have biomed training, a clinical engineer, um, or even a subject matter expert, even if you're looking at a specific device or modality, you are qualified. So factors um, are looking at, so consequence of a failure. So again, if you only have one of these devices, or if this device affects multiple um, service lines. So yeah, an ICU monitor isn't that, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, we've got replacement ICU monitors, but if that central goes down, uh, it affects a, a much broader swath. So OEM recommendations, the rationale, intrinsic maintenance needs, again, availability of backups, um, infusion pumps, you got plenty of those most of the time. Um, incident history, so critical equipment must also be identified in your AEM program. That's a requirement. And again, um, safety and effectiveness must be evaluated periodically. Now, periodically means something different to everyone. Um, I think the maximum is what, three years been seen is what I've seen. Uh, we do ours annually. I'm sure you guys review it annually or on a biannual basis. Um, but again, it, it's not enough just to evaluate risk. So equipment inspections, incoming inspections, all equipment must be inspected regularly uh, and tested before initial use and after major repairs. Um, hospital leadership, 
was assigned responsibility for the maintenance. And again, maintenance personnel qualifications, individuals responsible for overseeing, overseeing the program. Again, who's qualified for that? Look in the mirror, right? We're all professionals here. And records must be maintained. So you gotta maintain your competencies or your assessments of competencies. This is nothing new. This is something we've been doing for ages. So maintenance per uh, recommended maintenance activities or schedules. So OEM, if you're doing it OEM, follow the procedures, follow the schedule. Maintain the documentations of those recommendations, maintain the documents of maintenance activities. AEM program, um, again, risk, PM frequency, and PM work instructions should be maintained scheduled uh, or service records and equipment failures. And again, the, the inventories must be identified as AEM and OEM. So this is just a word of caution. We're all from different states. We all have different state or local guidelines to follow. Now, this is a point where the state does trump the federal. Um, so if your state requires more stringent than an AEM, so there are certain states that require OEM required maintenance. I'm not going to call those states out, but you do have to follow those. Same thing with, again, an FPA 99, CLIA, radiation protection. Um, Florida, for instance, has adopted an FPA 99 2018, which is wonderful. Hopefully we can get uh, the uh, federal government to uh, adopt those standards soon. <clears throat> so planning or planned, planned maintenance, unscheduled or corrective, execute or do uh, PMs, complete them. We've got to complete them when we schedule them on time. So plan, do, check, and act. It's a continuous circle. ISO is a continuous improvement project. So you always wanna to look to improve. Evaluate, uh, safety evaluation, effectiveness of the program. And again, implement. So what you learn, you learn from, you make adjustments and you move forward. It's, it's very much scientific process. You, you take what you learn, you apply it, you test and measure it again, you evaluate again, and, and you, again, continual improvement process. So, ISO 14971, 2019. We identify the combination of probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of harm. In other words, probability and severity uh, equals risk. Now, some of you guys are familiar with the, uh, I, I guess the Joint Commission model where you have nine blocks of probability and severity. It's the same model or very similar. So, why is the combination of two factors? Severity only indicates the consequences of failure. Um, probability only looks at the, the likelihood of the occurrence. So again, which transportation mode has a higher risk? Driving or riding in a car or flying in a commercial aircraft? So the severity, if you get into an accident with a car, may be minor to serious. Airplane, you might limp away, uh, but more than likely, uh, there's not gonna be survivors. But the probability, again, when we look at the likelihood, you're more likely to get into an accident on your way to the airport here in Atlanta than what you are once you get on the plane. 
Um, so, so it's, you know, again, very high that it, you could get into this accident that it could occur. Where air travel, it's very low. So again, two factors. So again, when we look at medical medical equipment, for example, uh, ICU patient monitor and a CPM and a portable pulse ox. And like, all right, so why does the, why is the CPM machine high risk? Which one of these has moving parts? All right. I couldn't tell you the last time that I had a uh, a failure that I could prevent on anything but possibly the CPM, um, just because there's hardly any moving parts nowadays. Um, Is it working? I think so. Yeah, we're moving now. I don't know what I just did. I thought I was just because I was pointing it at the wrong screen. All right. So again, uh, so risk-based criteria. This is something we all kind of, I guess, um, grew up with and loved, right? Sure. Right, right. No, and, and that's what I said. There's no true preventive maintenance that you can do on an ICU monitor. So, and that is more of a, a use um, error. So that's that's poor design. That's uh, purchasing at the lowest possible price to fill a need on something you have. Um, it, it you know for devices that's been cleared through the FDA for use in hospitals, not home use, which I'm seeing a lot of home use devices being brought into the hospital. And and well, our RT's pocket. Uh, and you know they're the ones making the decision on, you know, how how much uh, O2 a, a patient may need on a on a vent. So I don't like those. I don't like those in my hospital. I don't really get a say in it. Um, so the hospital's going to buy what the hospital's going to buy. Uh, we'll evaluate those risks as as we see them. A 
Although if it's 10 pounds light, bring it to my office. I, I could use to lose 10 pounds. So, um, all right. So the original, uh, I guess, risk-based criteria, not that it was uh, deemed that, uh, 60s and 70s. Um, what was it like in the 60s and 70s? Oh. <laughs> You're, you're, I wouldn't call on the old. I was just asking you, what was it like? Um, so again, um, devices were PM'd just to be PM'd. Um, Semi-annual, regardless of the potential risk. Um, I guess that's back when we had a big labor pool. I don't know what that's like either anymore. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, no, I took over for one guy that uh, did quarterly testing on uh, electrical safety testing on um, infant devices because he didn't want micro shocks to hurt the babies. And this was in the like 2000s. So I'm like, I, I don't, I think you're just padding your time. Um, <laughs> that seems unnecessary. Um, and again, to alleviate all unnecessary PMs, thinning cup. Benningco, right? Did I get that right? Yep. And Smith. I, Smith's an easy one. Um, proposed to classify equipment according to uh, equipment management number, which we all know and I'm sure have a love hate relationship. Uh, function plus physical risk plus maintenance requirements. Um, and again, with an EM uh, plus 12, you would schedule it according to a number factor. And, those numbers may be set locally or go by a corporate guideline on how often you're required to do planned maintenance or scheduled maintenance. Uh, and if it was less than 12, uh, it, it was run to fail. Everybody knows that one, remembers it, possibly even uses it today. Right, right, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, if you still had an OEM requirement, you you would still possibly perform the risk assessment, but at the end of the day, it's you know, it trumps this model, OEM requirements. Uh, and this uh, appeared in a TJC publication, which considered it sanctioned um, by the Joint Commission. Ah, everybody remembers this, right? No. You guys switch to something. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You guys can read over this when you download it. So both function and physical risk are uh, estimates of risk severity without considering probability. And this model uh, would be called severity-based criteria, or at least severity and maintenance requ uh, requirement criteria. Uh, Dr. Finnco actually never used the term risk-based, um, and it's unclear, I think Ben Singh did it, of who called it risk-based. And uh, I, again, with uh, George Mills bringing publicity to it, uh, kind of solidified this as a model. But again, increased severity does not necessarily mean you're going to increase uh, the number or quantity or frequency of PMs. Uh, now this one's easy, James Reason, Professor James Reasons. Everybody's seen this, right? Swiss cheese model of safety. So we, we try to either uh, have uh, engineered um, layers of safety to prevent failures or incidents uh, from, from occurring. So again, if you see on the bottom, this, the holes line up and that's when our incidents occur. That's when our failures occur. Uh, again, with fail safes, you try to build on that multiple layers that where none of those holes line up. So it won't necessarily get to the patient. So uh, again, um, risk can be reduced by multiple layers and increase or decrease the probability of failures. So for medical equipment, uh, these layers are the, the device, the user training, and the maintenance. So we can affect at least one of those, right? Maintenance. Um, 
we can also be proactive in the user training and care. Now, this is where you guys have a role in making sure that when you look at your data and you're seeing these use errors or you're seeing these repetitive issues, that's where you've got to bring it up to your admin, that nurse manager, recommend training, um, be proactive to prevent this before it occurs. And so the application, since the risk uh, is the combination of severity and probability, let's see how we can characterize it. So harm severity. Um, we use, again, a, a three-tier model, uh, none or minor, significant or serious, and death. So this is impact to patient or clinical user. And then the probability, again, likely, probable, unlikely. Uh, these are me measured with either failure rates or mean time between failures. And these are true failure rates. These are not failure rates for accessories. So is the equipment broke if an EKG lead wears out? Is the equipment, did the equipment break? If a finger sensor goes out, did that monitor fail or was it an accessory? What's it? You're right, you're right. However, the device still isn't broken, it's just got a bad, bad accessory. So we're looking at true failures. So when we put these two together, um, we have a block again that kind of resembles what you've seen with joint commission as far as uh, likelihood and severity. So equipment, uh, how equipment risk levels are used for planning. Remember again, high risk does not equal increased PMs. Defibrillator, high risk, right? Everybody would agree. When's the last time you really had a defibrillator? When's the last time you did anything to a defibrillator that would prevent it from failing other than replacing a battery? Anybody? You had one? So that was an AD. Okay. <laughs> but was that a, a AED or a defibrillator? Okay. So. Company that we do the work for, one of us, customers. Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, when planning for this, um, remember the CMS requirements, um, like lab equipment with uh, CLIA, blood bank equipment, uh, these require uh, OEM um, frequency and task. Uh, TPM, or true preventive maintenance, we are actually replacing something, O2 cells, um, you know, the hoses, uh, filters, whatever the case may be, true that's going to actually be a PM. We don't do a lot of those today. Maybe anesthesia, maybe a 10,000 hour on a ventilator. Um, so those you'll want to still kind of keep on an OEM basis. Um, but again, once you get data, you can evaluate that and then move from there. And others that may not be based off of, again, any type of um, 
requirement, but it may be wise to. So surgical robots, it costs more for me to even attempt to work on a Da Vinci robot than what it would just to have a contract. So I'm contracting um, radiation therapy, hyperbaric chambers, neonatal ICUs. It's not that the ICU equipment's gonna, for neonates is necessarily any less reliable. There's just more litigation potential with an infant versus, you know, 75, 80 year old. I feel like we just went through this. <coughs> so how equipment uh, risk levels are used for plan, uh, PM planning. Um, high, we're looking at one third of recommended frequency. Now that's not one third, if it's an annual, we're not looking at doing it every four months. That's saying that uh, one third of a year. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for the math. Um, so one quarter per medium and low run to fail. Now that's not saying that's the maximum. That's not saying that that's what you've got to do. That's saying we're, we're saying that's, that's your maximum and you can bring it in uh, as much as you need to. So um, again, safety and performance inspections, again, not true preventive maintenance. Uh, and these activity, activities, again, uh, ESTs are no longer required unless you live in certain states, but we're not gonna go there. Uh, and follow OEM recommended task unless evidence exists otherwise. So examples, SPO2. Milk or uh, BPMS. Uh, again, we're really just doing SPIs. So biannual is what the OEM recommends. We're going to run the fill those. They don't break. I mean, a display may go out in five to seven years, but uh, there's nothing I'm going to do preventively to stop that. Uh, PCA pumps, like a CAD Solus, there's uh, annual um, requirement. We perform those annual. Um, the only difference is, is that we consolidate where they have eight to 10 steps to get to run rate on a, a volume. We just do one. Defibrillators, again, this is annual as well, um, th that we also pr do the uh, performance testing. Uh, we're not really calibrating anything because most of them aren't required. And this is where I'm gonna pass it over to Ben Singh, who I'm sure you guys came out here for, not myself, so. But thank you. checks uh, because like that I, I came across several say, hey your PD pads are expired and I, I, I hope and pray that they always expire I don't like to see those being used um, so yeah no we, we do a lot of uh, again value add when we do that it's not just preventive some of its customer relations so yes what's the next step of that should you bring that up to risk manager or something point out here's the issue and make sure training is done Good point here. Uh, this is why we are into the discussion and conclusions part. Uh, I hope there are no clinicians here because I don't want to be killed. Uh, <laughs> There's an old saying uh, in the, this profession that sometimes you have to fix the equipment and sometimes you have to fix the user, right? And this is a point actually of AEM. We are not here to save money. 
we are here to save the patient. To save the patient, sometimes you have to look at the equipment, and sometimes you have to look at the users and the administration. One example, pulse oximeter. We had a lot of complaints about pulse oximeter turned out to be the probe. And the probe was acquired by the material management people choosing the lowest bidder and turned out to be actually a foolish decision because they had to replace the probe more often than buying a better quality probe. Okay, so the issue with the uh, disposable parts that have dates and lot numbers, etc., is the same thing. We need to train the users to do that. Actually, to be honest, I don't think we need can blame this entirely on the users themselves because the way the administration of healthcare is organized, they put a lot of heavy load on the clinicians who are supposed to really paying attention to the patients and not to details like looking at the expiration dates and, and moving equipment around, searching for equipment that they cannot find because someone hit it in the closet or on the, in the ceiling tile or something like that. We need a number of people that we call the, the assistant biomeds or equipment uh, or mobile equipment uh, uh, experts or, or uh, assistants to help them with this, this kind of things. They are not exactly what we call biomeds or imaging engineers, but they do something to help the clinicians to be more efficient. Okay, and, and that uh, type of uh, professional is sorely lacking in our organizations. So what's happening is that we are doing that job and. So it's not exactly the, the best use of our resources and to do uh, so-called PMC, electrical safety, especially every uh, six months or every even every year, it, it's of no really benefit to the patients. So ultimately, the idea of AEM, uh, George Mills and uh, uh, many of us here, including uh, fought for uh, with uh, CMS is to, hey, let us, pay attention to what is truly relevant, important that we can do to help because clinical engineering or HTM, the name says this, management is not maintenance. Management is more than just maintenance. We need to devote our attention to the right places where the outcomes will confirm that we are doing the right things. Okay, so let's move on to the thing. So it's, not just planning execution, we need to evaluate and improve, okay, that PDCA cycle, okay. A lot of people say, okay, we just do risk ranking and then we're done with it. No, 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 we, you have to do a whole lot more than that, okay. And we need to understand the reasons, the causes of the failures. If you don't understand the causes, you are fixing symptoms one by one. It's like you go to a doctor, doctor says, well, you have fever, okay, I'll give you some aspirin, go home. No, you have to find out why you have fever, okay? And so the AM is a starting point and also the reality changes. Things that you don't know can come back and bite you. So you, once you learn something, oh, wait a minute, there's something we didn't know that this can happen. We need to adapt and make changes. As I mentioned before, the 14971 was designed for manufacturers. They focus on the equipment they produce and what, how that can either harm a patient or put the patient at risk. Now, in the hospital, we have a different situation. We manage large quantities of sometimes medium risk devices like infusion pumps. Now, yeah, you have defibrillators that you have to watch and test and sometimes, etc. But how many? defibrillators you have versus how many infusion pumps you have. Once you have a recall of an infusion pump, most of you have experienced that, unfortunately, right? Understand this is a huge deal. It's not just the labor part, but also the effect on the care of the patients by the hospital, the interclinic. It's a huge deal. So the risk has to be also adjusted by the number of devices you have. You know? Yes, sir. It's not all so I appreciate you bringing up infusion pumps because I think based on what was said earlier with spares being a critical factor 
wouldn't that negate a higher risk due to a collective risk model if you had enough spares? Well, the, the question then is that do you, the hospitals have the money to buy spares? And yeah, if the spare yeah. is the, of the same brand and model, and then it is a recall of that brand and model, okay. the whole thing goes out the window, yep. right? So, Especially but, if you have a wireless model. <laughs> no comments here. I I personally provoke two recalls, and were severely uh, repriced by the manufacturer. Okay, so no comments here. Okay. So all I'm trying to say is that we need to think a little more broader than the than the uh, the uh, how the fourteen. 971 says, strictly speaking, because their focus, even the FDA focus is on single devices one at a time. They don't focus on the collective of the patients that is being cared for by the hospital. Okay, so the PDCA is the traditional continual improvement process, and this is 14971. As I said, this is for manufacturers. They do the risk analysis, risk evaluation, control, production, post-production, and then do continual improvement. The, the way we need to interpret this is a little bit different. We, we don't produce things, so we do the, the planning we do is service planning, mostly the PMs, right? And then we execute the, them, and then we have to evaluate, just like the manufacturers have to evaluate uh, the post-production results out there, complaints, et cetera. And then we have to revise the service plan just like they have to redesign their devices if necessary. So there is a correspondence, but we need to be careful what you do. Now, we have unfortunately this illusion for what, 30, 40 years at least, okay? Yes, we do 100% PM and everything should be fine. Now. How many of you believe really that school perfect school attendance guarantees to student learning? Yes, of course. You are a teacher right now, right? So that's why you have to say that you believe. Otherwise, no one would attend your classes, right? They might be afraid teachers would not appreciate that I have a month I don't know. There are many notable examples for those who uh, watched uh, that movie, uh, uh, A Beautiful Mind. I think you, you probably recall that he said, I'm not going to poison my mind by attending classes. <laughs> so we need to worry more about the outcomes than a numerical target. I much prefer that we be honest and say, hey, we only did 89% of the PMs, but on the other hand, the safety incidents and maintenance related issues are extremely low and we keep track of those things. Okay. That in my mind is an honest way to really manage maintenance instead of managing by the percentage of what's so-called completed. And by the way, now there is a small, if you wish, controversy about the term completed. The CMS demands completed, Joint Commission says yes, completed. And when you ask them what do you mean by completed, you know, if a piece of equipment is on patient, you cannot do the PM obviously, okay? So is that completed or it's incomplete, right? It's all documentation. Like, I mean, I think the interpretation comes back to 100% completion, comes back to documentation. So if you're using resolution codes for I cannot locate a device or it's in use on a patient, then you have visibility to go back to it in the following month. Yes, yes. I don't disagree with what you're saying. However, the term is confusing because completed is really done or it's because it's documented, right? Yeah, it's, so, it's your definition of complete. Is, it, is the work done or is the work order done? Which yeah. Which are two separate things. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we have a computer now from the data that you work at a hospital. We still have to send these like I do. We had no data. 
we would just kind of you know, try to figure out how to get things going based on what they told us. But now that you've got 40 years of data, you can go to the safety tree and say, look, when we buy equipment for the laboratory, it's plugged in from cradle to grave, right? But when we buy IV equipment, we're changing plugs all the time. So that tells you what you should be looking at and what you don't. Am I giving a good example? Yes, and that's not the only example. There are many, many examples. It's just that, unfortunately, most of us accumulate those work orders and never look at them. And more than that, we don't classify those work orders by the root causes of their problems. Oh, I replaced a PCB. Well, why you replace the PCB? Because someone dropped the infusion pump on the floor and broke everything inside? Or a lightning bolt struck the building? Or it is a self uh, problem inside the so-called smart pump that is actually not a smart, okay? And so we need to understand the causes of the problems in order to fix problems. And, and so coming back to the terminology issue, I'm starting to try to work with within our group here uh, inside the company to differentiate between completed to co because of documentation requirements to be and use of the term performed instead of done because done is, is, seems a little uh, too trivial. So we started to differentiate these two because otherwise we have a problem. We tell the hospital leaders that no, we did not complete the work order. So what do you mean? Yeah, because we were prevented from performing the PM. But no, 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 no. But the Commission wants you to complete the Okay, so all right, we'll satisfy the bureaucrats, et cetera, and say complete. But did we actually perform the work? No, we did not. Okay, so, but that's, bottom line here is that this is an illusion we need to somehow manage to clarify this for ourselves first, and then eventually the authorities about this, okay? Okay, so we need to classify the equipment by the root cause, and I'm not going to read all this because actually uh, Jason and I presented this uh, uh, a year ago in, in, Tampa. in Tampa, uh, but virtually, uh, so I don't know how many of those uh, uh, of you attended. But the bottom line here is that we are trying to imitate the evidence-based medicine that the clinicians have been adopting for several decades now, okay? Patients' uh, treatment cannot be judged by the number of visits with the doctor or nurses or anything like that. They have to look at the outcomes. It's just like the, you don't test the drug by just saying, okay, uh, how many people actually took the drug? No, you have to know what are the outcomes. Uh, well, I, I think by because of this COVID, you're sick and tired of hearing about it, the testing of the uh, of drugs, etc. It's the same idea here. We need to use the data as mentioned several times here, but we need to also to have clean data. Garbage in, garbage out is the slogan that you have heard many times, and we need to find a way to get around that. This is just one way of doing this, okay? There are many other ways to doing this. The idea here is to use as few classifications, codings of causes as possible because when you have a few dozens, people get sick and tired of looking for the right thing and also they don't have time for it. So they pick the first five and that's it, okay? So we proposed and we adopt, I worked previously in another company and we use a similar type of uh, approach. No problem found, unpreventable failure, accessory battery, network use, use, use include a lot of things. This problem needs to be dissected further if there, you have a lot of cases related to use, but then evidence failure, evident failure, uh, service-induced failure, we are not perfect. Also, the parts that we buy can have problems, hidden failure, potential failure, and predictable, preventable failure. So I'm going to run over these things very quickly because we are near the end. And uh, these are the four that we can affect directly. But as mentioned before, we are not just maintenance people, we are management people as well. We need to pay attention to the other parts here as well, okay? So, uh, uh, 
talking briefly about the safety evaluation and effective evaluation that's mandated by CMS. You need to do this for your own sake, not because CMS is telling you to do this. The, these two, in our view, is uh, the two sides of the same coin. One is safety and effectiveness is reliability, and both will affect the patient and the clinicians and the care of the patients in the hospital. Okay, there are some examples uh, that was done in my previous uh, role. So I'm not going to spend much time here. Uh, how you do safety evaluation, reliability, okay. So there are a lot of things that need to be done and eventually you come back and you make corrections and preventions to make sure that things don't repeat, okay. All right, so, so bottom line here is just to, to trying to summarize. This is the typical life cycle of equipment in a hospital. You plan, you buy, you use, you maintain, you retire and, and keep the cycle. However, we've spent, our main job here is this one here. And we think that we are doing a big thing for the hospital, but what the top echelon looks at is, oh, you spend a lot of money buying equipment, but that's 20% of the total cost of ownership. We spend about 1% of the total operating expense of the hospital. That's why we are in the basement and not upstairs. <laughs> okay, 1%. Okay. However, we have something that others don't have. If we use the data, we collect and use the data in a wise manner, we can affect the whole cycle backwards. And that's what we have to do to really get recognized for what we contribute, okay? All right, I'm not going to read all this. Uh, so there's a book uh, with a fish on it, so in case you want to look, right? And this is what we have done, uh, acknowledge the colleagues. And so comments, questions, criticisms. Yes, sir. So anybody in this room, um, and especially with, has anybody had to defend their ADM program to Joint Commission or DMV? Because yes. I, I was always fearful of transitioning from OEM because I did not. I'm curious as to what they deem the burden of proof as they're on site. What, what documents do you need to produce and how do you prove the effectiveness of your AEM program? Unfortunately, uh, the answer is that it's very uneven. The surveyors are not well trained. Yeah. Okay. Some just ask you, how do you plan? and never ask for evaluations, okay? okay. That's the, I, I believe the majority of all cases. Okay. Jason and I are corporate support for uh, several hundred of people out there, so we don't uh, participate in every survey that uh, happens, but if there is a question posed by the surveyor or state auditor, uh, our staff come back to us and ask us for help, how to explain things, etc., and we give them some verbiage to how to explain things. But typically, they are satisfied once they understand that we collect the data, we look at the causes of the problems, and then we uh, run the statistics to see what's happening. Now, we do have a privilege that some of you may or may not have, depending where you work, is that we cover about 100 hospitals, about over half a million pieces of equipment. So for us to get some statistics is yeah, a little bit know. easier. For you folks that you, you, you know, maybe in fusion pumps you have you know, a few hundred in a hospital, but uh, defibrillators you probably have a few dozen at, at best. So to get real statistics in a short period of time is really difficult. Okay, but we have to rely on the individual locations data as well and look at things because sometimes things are a little bit different from location to location. Yes. Hospital, yeah. Every time they have, they have to do 
every 12 you review uh, different pieces of equipment every six months, every 12 months. He's already done that. He does a lot of information on our academy. You've already implemented this and you don't even know it. Yeah. You've already implemented this and you didn't know it. Yes, sir. I mean, <laughs> there you go. Good for you. Other questions, comment? Yes, sir. One thing to add to that, I can say every time the joint producing inspectors ask me about that, the next question is usually, have you presented to your EOC and have they approved? Okay. Because they really want you, you've got to get that circle back to say, Hey, we're going to drop doing the new checks on all infusion pumps. Well, the ELC, some of the ELC say that's probably not a good idea. So if you've got that, that's usually that's, what. That's one of the things we require is EOC buy-in. So you have to show me that EOC approved it before we can change it. And at least once a year, you take it back to the EOC and say, can you reevaluate? We've reevaluated, and we're changing this to that, this to the other. And if one piece that you brought up that's really important that I think we miss, I mean, we all go back to our shops and we might, we have our joke, our fun time about what somebody on the floor has just done or something. But if you can get that person on the floor that will stop and you can train, there's nothing better. That piece really mm -hmm. is an important piece to buy that is they don't, they, they want to know. Uh, one example is, EKG, you said a bad lead wire. I went to an outpatient clinic and I showed them that if I pull the right arm, what are you going to get on the screen? She said, oh, no. I said, you know your vectors of the heart because if you pull once, you'll only get one lead. But when you put everything back together, you can't get ABLs without your three leads. So, and you can only get one lead from two leads because if one's gone, but if you lose green, leg it's gone forever so use your time on the floor there's some of them that don't want to talk to you leave them alone absolutely the ones that you want to listen to you take the time because the pulse oximetry is one thing we did again what's brakes on a pulse oximetry probe or the cable where are the other or so we had the floors to keep the unit secretary keep the cable in a, in a probe at their desk they mm -hmm. need to change the cable they'll tell the nurses please they don't even call us we very seldom get a call. Well, and also, I don't know if anybody else experienced that, but I mean, our user error since almost 34% of our hospital and contracting staff now have to skyrocket. You know? Right. So and that, that's become, something you can be become proactive. trainers, you know, instead of well, service I'm, personnel to do is trying to adapt to departments that have been flushed out that's, personnel and then just hire with temporary workers. That's where you walk this thin line of staying within your scope um, on that education piece. Are you sure you don't turn it on? I know the theory behind it, but as far as actually using it on a patient, uh, I highly encourage you to involve the education staff at your facility. And to the point of the management program, it also depends if you have like a survey readiness officer in your hospital, Mm -hmm. They have to buy in into what kind of program you're gonna run. If you have all the data that you want, but that survey rating this person doesn't feel confident and they just want to stop the mm -hmm. the interview at the we do what every manufacturer requires, so mm -hmm. that way there's no more scope into it, it's gonna be really hard for you to come up with any other current mm -hmm. that's what I'm currently facing. Even though we got eleven years of data and some equipment. Just the fact that you can stop the interview at like we do exactly what the manufacturer recommends, yeah, and provide the service documentation for that. They'd rather leave it at that than open a door for anything else. And yeah, I, but the next question is, do you have the documentation from the OEM? Yeah, and we do. Yeah. And that's a route. That 100 percent for 100 percent of your devices. If if even a single one you don't have, you by definition went into AEM. Because you don't have the recommendation. <laughs> it was amazing finding out that I could, I had to call a bunch of equipment and my customers. How many of the lawyers got involved and said, oh, whoa, whoa, we don't want to say how often things should be checked. I had one company that said it was up to the company who tests their equipment to decide how often it should be done. They didn't want to be caught. 
in a place where they make it mandatory to do it like this, and then somebody gets hurt because you didn't. Do it. I'm very surprised by what you, you uh, you're saying. Uh, what I heard from manufacturers, and you know, I used to work for manufacturers, uh, it's quite the opposite. The more they say you should do, the more protected they are. By the way, why do you think the devices now, for many decades actually, have uh, error codes inside the machine? Was that created by the manufacturers for you guys to service equipment or for them to defend themselves in a litigation? When I work for a major rental company of life support equipment ventilators, that's what the manufacturers told us. We put in those things so we can protect ourselves because, hey, the equipment did not fail, there's no error code, and your patient died not because of us, it's because you did not use things properly. And this was for young people way back when. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was this company that does not exist for several decades already, did that, called Puritan Bennett. Yeah. So, <laughs> other questions, comments, suggestions, criticisms? Oh, really appreciate we exhausted the time, and thank you for, thank you.